Across the globe, the reputation of politicians deteriorates with every passing day. It is easy to flick through history books and find the worst of the worst holding public office. But today, I want to discuss a person who ought to be considered a model statesman for his dedication to peace and free trade. Richard Cobden led a revolution of ideas, overthrowing the restrictive and dangerous thinking on economics and foreign policy which prevailed in 19th century Britain. By no means was this revolution solely restricted to Britain, Cobden became an international figure of renown, inspiring liberal movements across the world in places like France, Spain, and Italy. Richard Cobden was born on June 3rd, 1804, the fourth of 11 children in the Cobden family. The Cobden family lived and worked around a village in Hayshot in Sussex for a number of generations, but this was all to change. Richard's father, William, did not follow in his father's footsteps as a maltzer, instead decided to try his look at farming. William's poor farming skills resulted in the Cobden family selling their property in Sussex, being forced to move multiple times before finally selling down in Hampshire as tenant farmers. Despite their low status, Cobden gained elementary education at a dame school, but then transferred to a boarding school with his uncle's financial support until he was about 14. Despite a natural passion for learning, Cobden was forced by economic circumstances to cut his own studies short and search for employment. Thankfully, his uncle Richard Ware Cole, who owned a warehouse business in London, gave him a job as a clerk, and eventually, Cobden became a travelling salesman, selling cotton prints earning a commission on each sale. While it was not the most glamorous of jobs, Cobden excelled at it, sharpening his skills of persuasion which would come to serve him later in life. But Cobden's uncle noticed the success and observed that he was addicted to reading and studying all kinds of ideas, especially political economy, his favourite subject. He warned Cobden that his fondness for book knowledge was an evil omen for his future as a man of business. Cobden was undeterred by his uncle's pessimism. Even if he could not have a traditional education through formal schooling, Cobden would spend as much time as possible reading in public libraries across London. In a letter to his brother, Cobden expressed his deep love for learning, writing that, You know that I do not live except to learn. Through his work as a salesman, Cobden had become intimately familiar with the ins and outs of the muslin and calico industries. By 1828, Cobden established his own business along with two former co-workers, and by 1831, the trio became confident enough to take over an old calico printing factory in Manchester and print calicos of their own. Cobden's business venture was a roaring success, but he always dedicated ample time to his studies. He became familiar with the writings of Adam Smith, who had argued in his seminal work, The Wealth of Nations, that free trade, not protectionism, was the surest path to prosperity. Equipped with the teachings of Adam Smith, in 1835, Cobden wrote a series of letters for the Manchester Times, which was a radical newspaper that often published articles advocating for free trade. Itching to further engage with intellectual matters, Cobden penned his first ever pamphlet in 1836, entitled England, Ireland and America, under the pseudonym A Manchester Manufacturer. Despite being nearly 200 years old at this point, the arguments Cobden made in this pamphlet are profoundly applicable to the modern world, especially in the context of the United States. He advocated for cutting military expenditures, a foreign policy of non-intervention, and economic policy of free trade. Cobden began his pamphlet by stressing the opportunity costs of military spending, explaining that every farthing of which goes in the shape of taxation from the pockets of the public. Military expenditures were not a public good, but in fact often could be a drain on the economy. Unlike private spending, which can generate further wealth, money spent on the military produces no new wealth. Politicians, generals, and government workers benefit from this influx of cash. But the vast majority of people gain no advantage from excessive military spending. Politicians often evoke the common good of all, but in reality the benefits all flow to a special class of people. Cobden argued that the honours, the fame, the annulments of war belong not to the middle and industrious classes. The battle plain is the harvest field of the aristocracy, watered with the blood of the people. Across the pond, America flourished economically, and Cobby attributed this to the low taxes in America that allowed for industrious individuals to save and invest their wealth to create new products more worthwhile than weapons of mass destruction. All that military spending had achieved was to accrue hundreds of millions of pounds of debt. Cobden described British history during the last century as the tragedy of British intervention of politics in Europe, in which princes, diplomatists, peers, and generals have been the authors and actors, the people, the victims, and the morrow will be exhibited to the latest posterity in 800 millions of debt. In Cobden's day, England was the country that was continually sending troops abroad to meddle in foreign affairs, in much the same way the United States does today in its role as so-called policemen of the world. 
Intervention abroad was often justified in the grounds of maintaining a balance of power. Since 1701, starting with King William, English politicians regularly brought up the concerns over the balance of power in Europe that England was apparently supposed to uphold. But Copeland showed that this idea was wholly inconsistent, had no real meaning, and that it was merely a pretense for politicians to launch others headlong into foreign wars. Cobb described the concept of the balance of powers as a chimera. It is not a fallacy, a mistake, an imposture. It is an undescribed, indescribable, incomprehensible nothing. Mere words. In reality, politicians use this vague term to justify their expeditions abroad for their own benefit. Cobden pointed to America, interestingly enough, as a shining example of a country that had followed the most beneficial foreign policy, because unlike England, America had experienced 50 years of peace except for two years in a defensive war. Cobden was firmly against intervention abroad. He believed that it did not benefit the intervening nation or the nation in question. He concluded that the wisest policy for England is to take no part in these remote quarrels. But what if a country had an oppressive regime, which ought to be toppled? Yet again, Cobden answered in the negative. Contrary to some modern-day advocates of nation-building, Cobden reminded those who wished to implement enlightened government abroad that it is not by the means of war that states are rendered fit for the enjoyment of constitutional freedom. The push towards greater freedom was, in Cobden's eyes, the result of education, not force. Therefore, any sort of paternalistic intervention would merely end in perpetuating further miseries. The best policy for England was to focus inward and to purify our own institutions, not focusing outwards, instead serving as a beacon for other countries. Cobham believed that free trade was a prudent economic policy that would improve material prosperity, yes, but he also theorized that free trade amongst nations would bring about lasting peace. Cobden concurred with George Washington, the first American president, who said that the great rule of conduct for us in regard to foreign nations is, in extending our commercial relations, to have with them as little political connection as possible. The logic is, is that when nations have no trade relations, there is nothing to lose from conflict. But when military might is replaced with commercial ties and interdependency, countries will see no reason to go to war with one another. Evoking the example of America again, Cobden explained that England and America are bound up together in peaceful fetters by the strongest of all ligatures that combine two nations to each other. Commercial interests. This makes it near impossible for the two to ever even conceive of going to war with one another. If all nations adopted free trade and mutually relied on one another, world peace would become an achievable goal because in Cobden's words, the more any nation traffics abroad upon free and honest principles, the less danger it will be of foreign wars. In short, Cobden advocated for as little intercourse between governments, but as much connection as possible between nations. By June in the same year, Cobden toured America for about three months while writing his next pamphlet, entitled quite simply, Russia, in which he argued against the prevailing fears of Russia, and yet again advocated for non-intervention and commerce. Throughout 1836 and 1837, Cobden travelled to Spain, Turkey, and even Egypt. Importantly, his travels affirmed the importance of trade. He observed that wherever he went, trade promoted the breakdown of former animosities between different races, creeds, and religions. By his return to Manchester in 1837, Cobden had become a leading citizen, now a member of the Chamber of Commerce and an alderman. Remembering his own deprivations, Cobden took great interest in extending non-sectarian education to a more significant number of people, especially the poor. While speaking at towns near Manchester, Cobden met a man named John Bright, who had become an important ally and a great friend. Cobden had become increasingly confident in his abilities and decided to partake as a candidate in the general election of 1841, but was narrowly defeated. But Cobden was not swayed by this. Instead, he began to turn his attention towards the issue that would define his career. The Corn Laws. During the Napoleonic Wars lasting from 1803 to 1815, the British blockaded imports from continental Europe in an attempt to economically isolate Napoleon's empire. But the war had ended in 1815. There was no reason to continue this blockade. But the Corn Laws were introduced to protect British farmers from cheaper foreign imports. The Corn Laws barred the entry of any foreign corn unless the price was above 80 shillings a quarter. These rules were happily received by aristocratic landlords who made a hefty profit from higher prices and were insulated comfortably from any foreign competition. Corn was a staple in the diet of the poorest of Britain, but the laws dramatically raised the price of corn, causing immense suffering on the most deprived people, with some even starving. As we've already seen, Cobden supported free trade, but this issue was more than just a matter of prudent economics. Cobden saw the Corn Laws not only as an economic issue, but a moral one. Aristocrats and the large landowners grew rich from high prices, but at the same time starving families scrimped and saved to buy meagre loaves of bread. For Cobden, few things were more morally repugnant than the disgusting behaviour of aristocrats who used the law for their own benefit against the weakest in society. 
The first Anti-Corn Law Association was founded in London in 1836, and under Cobden's guidance another association was established in Manchester, which soon became the Nationwide League, with Cobden and Sean Bright, who are now firm friends, at the helm of the movement. The Anti-Corn Law League had a simple, singular aim, to abolish the Corn Laws. But how is this to be achieved? Cobden was the mastermind behind the League's strategy, organising a pressure group unprecedented in intensity and single-mindedness. Impressive numbers of meetings, lectures and debates were held across the country, while at the same time, newspapers, journals and pamphlets were distributed in massive quantities to the public to educate them on economic principles. The repeal of the Corn Laws was turned into a moral issue that invigorated the middle and working classes to become involved in politics to an extent unheard of before the League's creation. But members of the League were not merely arguing against the Corn Laws. They were arguing for a monumental shift towards free trade. Cobden stressed time and time again that if one was to advocate for free trade, they ought to also be an advocate for peace, because free trade was the best method of promoting peace. In one speech he stated that, I see the free trade principle, that which shall act on the moral world as the principle of gravitation in the universe, drawing men together, thrusting aside the antagonism of race and creed and language, and uniting us in the bonds of universal peace. The anti Cornwall League was an unprecedented campaign of changing public opinion, and through a myriad of tracts, advertisements, lectures, debates, pamphlets and speeches, the League was starting to have an effect on people's minds, and was shifting the public towards free trade. But change people's minds alone was not enough. The League organised candidates throughout the country run for election. By 1841, a general election was called, and Cobden ran for election representing Stockdale and Manchester, one of the most populous districts in Britain. Cobden stormed the polls and was elected as Member of Parliament. Now, it's important to stress that Cobden was nothing like the majority of Parliament. First off, he was middle class. He had actually worked a proper job in his life. He had felt the pressures of economic necessity, something pretty alien to most members of Parliament who were born into wealthy families. Most, if not all, of Parliament was also formally educated at the most prestigious places like Oxford and Cambridge, where they had taken part in debating societies, honing their oratory for years on end in what were referred to as nurseries of a statesman. But the majority of Cobden's education had taken place in the library. Seeing just how different Cobden was from the average member of Parliament, it is no wonder that when he first entered Parliament, he was not given the same courtesy as he was expected to a courting member. His opponents didn't expect much. After all, he was the son of a failed farmer. His Tory opponents expected him to flounder, flop and fail, and only then would he know his place. But when Cobden first addressed Parliament, he dispelled any doubt of his credentials as a first-rate orator. Cobden had spent his life dealing with and talking to normal people. He put no stock in flowery language or quoting great ancient authorities. He spoke with an unadorned eloquence. Directness, simplicity and rationality were the defining characteristics of his oratory. He rarely raised his voice or harangued his adversaries. Instead, he opted for a style of argument that emphasised the reasonableness of his position. In his first address to Parliament in August, Cobden gave a simple yet compelling speech in which he deftly articulated his views in the Corn Laws and how they needed to be repealed immediately to alleviate the suffering of the poor. Impressively, he had transformed what would have been a dry economic debate into a discussion of a moral issue now placed at the heart of British life. His speech shocked Parliament, who did not expect such eloquence from a common man. Throughout the seven-year struggle to repeal the Corn Laws, Cobden dedicated himself so wholly to the cause, being on the move perpetually, delivering speeches, organising rallies and writing for newspapers. John Bright often accompanied him on the road, and on the stage, the two complement each other's styles, with Cobden explaining the facts of the Corn Laws and Bright delivering the more emotionally charged, moral invective to hammer home the point. And through their camaraderie, the two became the best of friends, with a hint of rivalry between the pair. An anecdote recorded by Bright shows the true dedication of Cobden to the cause of free trade to alleviate poverty. In 1841, John Bright's wife, who he'd only married two years earlier, tragically succumbed to tuberculosis. Bright was distraught at the loss of his wife, who he loved dearly. Cobden approached the grief stick and Bright and offered his condolences. After some silence, he sternly turned to Bright and explained that there are thousands of houses in England at this moment where wives, mothers and children are dying of hunger. He advised that once Bright was ready, he should follow him into the breach one more time and keep fighting until the Corn Laws were repealed. By the September of 1845, Cobden had run himself ragged on the road for five years, delivering speeches a thousands day after day had exhausted him. 
But because of his dedication, Cobden had barely seen his wife and his business was suffering from neglect. He wanted to quit. But Bright refused to allow him to leave and convinced Cobden that without him, the fight couldn't continue. The duo are a testament to friendship's importance. Neither would let the other one quit on their ambitions. And their hard work paid off. In 1846, the Tory Prime Minister Robert Peel put forward a bill proposing the gradual repeal of the Corn Laws over three years, with the bill eventually being altered to accommodate immediate and total repeal. On May 16, 1846, the House of Commons passed the bill, 327 to 229. The House of Lords was astonished by the immense support for the repeal and quickly complied, passing the bill, 211 to 164. In his resignation speech, the Prime Minister of Peel acknowledged that Cobham was the man behind the repealing of the Corn Laws. A Tory praising a radical such as Cobham was a rare sight indeed. Still, he was a man deserving of lavish praise, even though he was often too humble to ever accept it. The anti corn League has been recognised by historians as one of the most effective single-issue pressure groups to have ever existed. Future reform movements would follow the anti corn League's example and adopt similar strategies. The League would not have been nearly as successful without Cobden's practical organisational skills and strategic approach. With its objective completed, the League held its final meeting to disband, but not before rewarding the Riri Cobden. Over the course of seven years, Cobden had wholly dedicated himself to repealing the Corn Laws, neglecting his business, ignoring his own health, being apart from his family. Cobden had spent so much time away from home that his five-year-old son did not even recognise him. But in recognition of his tireless service to Britain, a public subscription of £80,000 was raised, which Cobden used to repay his debts and buy back his childhood home, which he had lost all those years ago in Sussex. The success of the Anti-Corn Law League made Cobden a major celebrity not only in his native Britain, but also across Europe. Cobden decided to strike while the iron was hot and toured Europe throughout 1846 and 1847 to convince the intelligentsia, politicians and leaders to adopt free trade. Over 14 months, Cobden visited France, Spain, Italy, Germany, Prussia and even Russia. For Cobden, free trade was the great panacea that would bring material prosperity and peace to Europe. In his mind, it was only logical that all nations, not just Britain, ought to adopt a free trade policy. While abroad, a local election was held and despite being absent, Cobden was elected for MP again two different constituencies. Following his return from the continent, Cobden funneled his efforts towards promoting peace by urging the government to adopt a foreign policy of non-intervention and reducing military spending. To this end, Cobden proposed bills in favour of arbitration and mutual arms reduction. Although Cobden fought valiantly, he was ultimately unsuccessful, a trend that would continue as he struggled to persuade his peers in Parliament of the dangers of meddling in others' affairs. Not budging an inch, Cobden's over several years opposed the Opium Wars, the Crimean War and intervention at the American Civil War. Cobden was often referred to as anti-English by his detractors. Vending his infuriation at the foreign policy of Britain to his confidant, Bright, Cobden condemned Britain, stating that, I consider that we are a nation are little better than brigands, murderers and poisoners, and our dealings at this moment with half the population of the globe. With a distinct distaste for aristocratic rule, Cobden placed the blame for pointless wars and the aristocratic class's brash attitude towards it, that often plunged Britain headlong into endless cycles of wars for their own benefit. After declining a position in Lord Palmerston's administration in 1859, Cobden made contact with the French economist and free marketeer Michel Chevalier. While visiting France, Chevalier urged Cobden to meet with the French Emperor, Napoleon III, and convince him of the benefits of free trade. Despite some initial scepticism of Cobden's arguments, the Emperor was won over eventually signing a trade agreement drafted by Chevalier in 1860. This treaty has now been dubbed by historians as the first modern trade deal. In a kind of cutesy way, the treaty was named the Cobden Chevalier Treaty, after the pair that made the deal happen in the first place. With this new treaty in place, trade rapidly increased between both France and Britain, enriching both of them at the same time. How wonderful. But upon his return home, Cobden was offered titles such as Baron and another position in government that he promptly declined, favouring independence over personal advancement. In 1865, Cobden was suffering from bronchial irritation, making breathing agonising. And despite his best attempts at looking after his health, Cobden passed away on the 2nd of April, 1865, at the age of 60 in London. He was surrounded by his family and, of course, his dearest friend, John Bright. After his death, Bright expressed his deep love for Cobden in something that I find ridiculously heartbreaking. He said that, I have only one thing to say, that after 20 years of most intimate and almost brotherly friendship, 
I little knew how much I loved him until I had lost him. Bright sentiment was not only shared in Britain, but across Europe, where Cobden inspired budding liberals such as Frederick Bastiat to promote free trade in their countries. Cobden had become a living legend within his own lifetime, attaining acclaim from all sections of society. In many ways, he was an unconventional politician for his time, and even today. He did not follow party lines and instead always sided with his conscience, not the demands of careerism. For his refusal to take part in party politics throughout his career, Cobden was viewed as a man above self-interest. But this moral virtue did not come from the upper echelons of society, but instead from below. Which of Cobden's positive traits can be traced back to his middle-class background, his plain style of speaking, his excellent organisational skills, his faith in the efficacy of free trade? These all stem from his humble origins. I think that Cobden was not a great politician in spite of his lack of aristocratic status. I think he was a great politician because he lacked aristocratic status. Throughout his life, he was immensely proud that his lot in life was not decided by birth, but by his own efforts. Cobden and the anti corn League did not repeal every protectionist tariff. However, they did create intellectual environment, as well as the precedent to show that the free market was not merely a theory, but a real, practical policy. This task of cutting tariffs would be taken up by the Prime Minister, William Eric Gladstone, who had praised Cobden by saying, I do not know that I have ever seen in public life a character more truly simple, noble, and unselfish. By 1890, Gladstone had reduced the number of tariffs in Britain from 1,200 to 12. It is hard to imagine this happening without people such as Cobden creating the fertile environment in which free market ideas could come to flourish. Until the very end of his life, Cobden had been an apostle of free trade, describing a world where antagonisms of race, country, and creed were subsumed by the mutually beneficial cooperations of nations spanning the globe. Sadly today, barriers to trade are being re-erected by nationalist movements and endless wars perpetuate misery. Thankfully, Cobden's advice is the perfect antidote to the chauvinistic economic nationalism and hawkish neoconservatism of today. Free trade promotes material prosperity and peace, the prerequisites of any form of societal progress. Cobden would be shocked and appalled if he could see the state of American foreign policy today. The America he had hailed as a beacon of free trade and non-intervention has morphed into an empire maintained by the most gargantuan military budget on the planet. The words, passions and actions of people like Cobden are needed now probably more than ever to combat the growing list of illiberal opponents to cosmopolitanism and free trade. Thanks, Mill, for listening. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And if you did, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you may listen to podcasts. Visit the website www.libertarianism.org to find more podcasts like this one. I hope to see you next time.